Okay, so the remit of my talk today is to show you that cemented total hip replacement is a viable option in modern orthopedics. In fact, in my personal view, it is a better option. Um, it has a lot of evidence associated with it. So the way I'll run this uh, talk is I'll show you um, just an introduction of uh, a cemented total hip replacement and a brief uh, word on the history. Then I'll show you some steps which are intraoperative photographs of the technique of a cemented total hip, the way we do it at Wrightington Hospital. After that, we'll go to a short video, which will show how the operation is done. And then we have a few cases at the end for discussion. If we get time, then uh, I can show some of the evidence. So just as a way of introduction, I don't know how many from the audience who have joined the webinar have ever seen a long-term follow-up of any form of hip replacement at 50 years. I doubt that any one of you have seen that. So this is the X-ray of a 50 year follow-up of uh, a cemented low frictional torque arthroplasty uh, done by John Charlie with a 22 millimeter <clears throat> metal head on a monoblock first generation tapered polished uh, stem, which was a Charlie arthroplasty and a cemented cup. And this really summarizes the legacy that Charlie has left us. So let's go to some history. I'm sure that all of you know the concept of low frictional torque <clears throat> arthroplasty using a small 22.2 to 5 millimeter femoral head, which creates a low frictional torque and allows the use of a thicker polyethylene. It optimizes the head neck ratio and gives good long term results. So these are some of the other slides of um, the way Chan Lee developed his hip replacement. Presently, what we are using is um, a C-stem, which is a triple tapered polished cemented stem uh, with, um, with, with an acetabular component that is also made of polyethylene and is cemented. And we have good data coming up to 15 to 20 years now of the C-stem. So let's go to how we actually do the surgery. So this was a case that I was going to show. Um, painful arthritis of the left hip. It's important that you concentrate on patient selection. The patient should have uh, symptoms that correlate with clinical examination findings, um, causing sufficient pain, uh, affecting function, and that should correlate with radiological evidence of good grade four end stage arthritis. Uh, templating is very important. Um, even though it might not always accurately predict the size of the components, it does help draw your attention towards issues like leg length, uh, like offset. Um, and if you do templating on the lateral side, any femoral deformity or acetabular problems. Uh, we also tend to get x-rays of the spine if required to look at your spinal pelvic alignment. So I do my total hip replacements using a standard posterior approach. And I was told that all of you will be familiar to, with a posterior approach. So we won't spend too much time discussing the surgical approach. This is my setup in the operating theater. Uh, we have laminar flow and um, all your typical uh, striker hoods. The patient is prepped and draped. Make sure that the patient is positioned correctly so that you know exactly where the pelvis will be. So I like to expose the sciatic nerve and identify it. And um, in cases with heavy muscular uh, people or high risk cases, um, like uh, DDH, I would uh, release the gluteus maximus tendon insertion that helps to relax the sciatic nerve. Another useful pointer to relax the sciatic nerve is to keep the hip extended and the knee flexed. So going ahead, after taking down the short external rotators and the capsule, which I like to do in two separate layers, you mark the length. So I use a Chanli pin in the supraacetabular area of the bone and then mark the length using the, the links on the chain. And in the end, once you have done your trial reduction, you can check the length again. Then you dislocate your hip, the neck has been cut, and that's the exposure of the acetabulum. So this is the left hip that we are looking at. And uh, this retractor is the anterior wall retractor, which is positioned anteriorly and superiorly. And this is the inferior retractor, which is positioned where you would normally find your transverse acetabular ligament or the TAL. 
the purpose of reaming for a cemented hip replacement is not really to expand the socket and philosophically this is where it probably differs from an uncemented socket the purpose is only to take out the cartilage from the acetabulum and to try and save the bone so we like to do a bone preserving operation reaming is minimal it is only designed to take the cartilage out and to give you nice bleeding bone and um, if there is good subcondyl bone then i would preserve the subcondyl bone as well and uh, make multiple drill holes for the cementation so this is the the step drill for making multiple drill holes so that you can get your cementation nicely and you can see the punctate bleeding in the acetabulum this is a cup holder which is used for holding the cup so the standard head size that i use is 28 mm in smaller patients i have no hesitation in using a 22 mm head and rarely i would use a 32 mm head so this is a marathon polyethylene cup that is the standard that we use at the moment this is peroxide once you put the peroxide swab into the acetabulum it gives you a nice dry surface uh, pulse lavage is very important for modern contemporary third generation cementation wash out all the debris make sure that the drill holes are clear to take your cement and the surface should be dry that's your cement being pressurized and that's the pressurizer that we use it's like a blue rubber diaphragm you can actually use a dry thumb to squeeze the cement and directly uh, put it into the individual holes before this goes on once you have pressurized it that's the socket going in you judge your inclination and your version using whatever usual landmarks you use Uh, there are always multiple landmarks including the transverse acetabular ligament and once you have done the acetabulum we go to the femur again the key in the femur is to get an entry point that is adequately lateral and then you clear the loose bone using broach try and preserve good cancellous bone behind so that you can get good cementation to occlude the canal you can use a synthetic um, a plug like sara plug or bio stop or whatever is commercially available uh, in this case and uh, my my preference is to use a bone block so the instrument that you can see in the top right picture is a roblevsky bone block harvester which is like a hollow mill or a core or basically you take the bone block out from the proximal femur and you compact it then you do the remaining steps opening up the proximal part of the femur with your reamers and then broaching gently once you've got your trial broach in and you've finalized your size based on your template you do a trial reduction in a trial reduction you check for impingement for instability take the hip through a full range of movement do the combined antiversion test make sure that your length and your offset is restored and that's the way i check for hip stability check for lengths check the shock so that you know your tension is correct and once you're happy with that then you can go ahead and perform your cementation so that's the bone block going in into the femur that will occlude the canal and once you have washed it and dried it you get a beautiful cancellous host surface to take the cement that's the cement going in with a gun this is standard setting cmw cement uh, for the acetabulum i used a fast setting version of cmw then you pressurize your cement in and that's your final stem going in you can control the version of the stem based on your trial reduction once the stem is gone in you can repeat your trial reduction the final head size in this case i've used a metal head and then a formal repair of the posterior approach with whatever technique that um, you are used to and that's the final x ray which shows the total hip replacement well positioned stem well positioned socket a good white out on both sides and another example of a cemented total hip replacement so what i'll try and do now is i'll dive out of this presentation we'll come back to the data on survivorship if you get time and i'll try and open the video which shows the similar steps ah oh, it works excellent so we'll start again where the acetabulum has been exposed that's your fat pad the reaming has to be performed very gently the idea is not to take away too much bone but just to take the cartilage away 
even if there is some irregularity in the overall shape of the acetabulum, it does not matter. Osteophytes are coming out and then the cup sizer. So I know what, um, I like to leave about seven millimeters between the size of the reamer and the size of the cup that I take. So if I've reamed up to 50 millimeters, which is the top size of the reamer, then the cup would be a 43 by 28 cup. Those are the drill holes going with the, with the step drill. And then peripherally, there is often very good sclerotic bone and there is some cartilage as well. So that was a ring curette, which takes the cartilage out. Then you do your pulse lavage and dry the surface with peroxide. For the acetabulum, we use a bowl mixing. Your cement goes in and a combination of finger pressurization and um, pressurization with the help of the blue diaphragm. So for fast setting cement, it usually sets between five and six minutes. So I would pressurize till about two and a half to three minutes and then my cup would go in. If your patient is correctly positioned in the lateral position and that rod is uh, perpendicular to the plane of the floor, then you get your inclination to about 45 degrees. And your version you judge according to your usual landmarks, especially the transverse acetabular ligament, wherever it is visible. So the excess cement is coming out while my assistant holds the cup in the position by putting that rod. And with the two fingers, you can fine tune the position, hold it steady until the cement has set. Clean everything out. And that's the local infiltration technique, which we use routinely for pain management. And especially if you're doing uh, overnight stay hip replacements, or if you're trying to move towards uh, day case hip replacements, the key really is good pain management. That's the femur now. The bone was quite sclerotic, so I'm using an osteotome just to define the proximal neck. And then that opens up uh, your lateral entry point, the trochanteric reamer, just to create the space in the proximal femur. And then the taper pin reamer to just establish the canal. Try and stay as lateral as you can so that you go straight down the femur and the stem does not go into varus or valgus. These are the brooches for the standard C stem. So we use this, the classic C stem, which has a 9 10 taper. Some of my colleagues also use the AMT C stem, which has a 12 14 taper. I think Abhijit, the classic C stem is not available in India, is it? It's mainly the AMT. Yeah, so that's the yeah. trial reduction. You can see. Correct. So I'm taking it through a full range of movement, flexion, full adduction, complete extension, internal rotation, external rotation, check for impingement, then check your leg lengths, measuring the, and you know, based on your templating, how much lengthening you want to achieve, if at all. A few millimeters of lengthening is almost inevitable because when you get arthritis, you actually lose length. Now, in this case, I've used a synthetic uh, occlusion uh, device that was a biostop, pulse lavage to take out all the cancellous bone. So for the femoral side, for this particular case, I'm using Palakos gentamicin cement. And it comes with its own uh, mixing gun. It's very important that you train your nurses to mix the cement correctly because cementation is all teamwork. It's not just down to the surgeon. It has to be mixed correctly according to the manufacturer's instruction. And there is a learning curve to doing the cemented hip, just like any other surgery, really. So the cement is going in. Pressurization of the cement. And you can see the fat coming out if you pressurize it nicely. So for Palacos, it takes between 10 and 11 minutes to set. It does depend upon how it is stored and ambient temperature. So I tend to pressurize it till about four, four and a half minutes. 
the stem usually goes in between four and a half to six minutes or under under five and a half minutes usually you can see it's going in comfortably that thumb if you leave the thumb on the calcar and just use the rod pusher you get your stem going perfectly in the center of the femur without any varus or valgus ceramic head that has gone on to the stem once the cement sets before the ceramic head goes in i would normally do a trial reduction and uh, then put the ceramic head in so i think that's the end of the video and uh, we can move on to the cases now So we'll start with uh, the cases that you normally get in your practice. Just uh, some simple, straightforward cases of different types of arthritis. Abhijit, is it still visible? Everything yeah, is still visible. You are going fine. Everything good. Just full screen. Okay. Yeah, good. And we are okay for timing. No, no, you are doing good. Please continue. Okay. These are interesting cases. So this is a example of a protrusio hip where the femoral head has gone medially. Now the key for protrusio to get a good result is to perform bone grafting of the floor of the of the acetabulum. Whether you use cemented sockets or uncemented sockets is up to individual preference. But in this case, you can see that with good bone grafting and a cemented socket, and even at ten years, it looks like it was done um, just last week. So good data of cemented hips in protrusio. Good long-term data. So this is. a typical case we get a lot of uh, ddh in young adults and adolescents so a large part of my practice is doing hip replacements in 17 and 18 year olds <clears throat> with uh, ddh uh, with sufi with uh, uh, sequelae of perthes disease um infection and uh, these are often multiply operated patients they have had four or five open surgeries sometimes they've had elizar of hip reconstructions leg lengthening so these are really challenging operations you need a lot of planning and this is not a ddh lecture so we'll not discuss about uh, the hip center and everything but you can see that my preference is to use a cemented socket using a structural bone graft <clears throat> to make up the deficit superiorly and posteriorly these are small sized cemented stems these were designed <clears throat> in the about 20 30 years ago uh, to for for smaller sized bone they are called asian sea stems but you get small sized patients in in all ethnicities and you can see the follow up at 10 years with the femoral head bone graft uh, united nicely and the hip replacements also looking quite nice uh, this is an example of a spondylo epiphyseal dysplasia in a young girl in her 20s with both the hip joints quite deformed very arthritic and the acetabulum is also quite deformed so this is fairly uh, standard of the type of case that um, that we get in our practice this is the ct scan which shows the defect in the acetabulum and this was a bilateral simultaneous um, cemented total hip replacement on both sides using a femoral head bone graft to reconstruct the acetabulum and a cemented total hip replacement another example of a multiple epiphyseal dysplasia in this case the spine wasn't affected that badly again this was a bilateral simultaneous cemented total hip replacement using asian sea stems we have got good data on asian sea stems now coming up to almost 20 years which has been presented and published as well another example of a high ddh a heart of philocrates dislocation or you can call it a cro ranavat grade 4 if you wish treated with <clears throat> a bone graft this was um, a young 17 year old boy who had had multiple operations for slipped upper femoral epiphysis and he finally got avascular necrosis so this was him at 17 treated with um, a 22.2 to 5 mm ceramic head if the if the diameter of the acetabulum is small and you can only get in a reamer of 44 or 46 mm then i have no hesitation in using a smaller cup of 38 mm or 40 mm outer diameter and a 22 mm um, ceramic on polyethylene bearing and our dislocation rate for 22 mm heads um, is a, is less than 1% so instability is not really a fear so these are 
again some of the trauma applications and you can see this was a femoral head and a femoral neck fracture treated with a cemented total hip replacement he's coming on to almost 9 years this was an example of delayed trauma so this was an acetabulum that i had reconstructed several years ago and after a few years he got arthritis of the hip joint this was treated with a cemented total hip replacement and impaction grafting of the floor of the acetabulum and this x ray is follow up at coming approximately 6 years this was a case of bilateral um, ankylosing spondylitis again this was a bilateral simultaneous total hip replacement done using cement these were amt stems these are not classic c stems so we have both stems on the shelf this was an example of a, an arthrodesed hip treated with uh, again a cemented hip replacement using a trochanteric osteotomy we don't really use the trochanteric osteotomy that frequently now but it is useful to know how to use it so in difficult cases if you ever have to use it then you can and you can repair it well this was an acute <clears throat> acetabulum fracture in an elderly gentleman who was in his 60s and unfortunately because of a massive pulmonary embolus he was only referred to me at about 4 weeks um almost one third of my practice is dealing with pelvic and acetabular trauma so i do get a lot of um, cases of uh, sequelae of trauma and post traumatic problems so this was the ivc filter that he had in and when we when i went in at 4 weeks the posterior wall was really completely destroyed and the only way you could salvage this was with a total hip replacement so this is an acute uh, total hip replacement some people like to call it the combined hip operation or the fix and replace so i've used this femoral head as a structural head graft to rebuild the acetabulum and then you fix it with a plate which buttresses the graft because the graft is mainly posterior rather than superior so it is subjected to a lot of shear stress and using a posterior column plate really helps in getting the graft compressed nicely then you ream and you shape the graft additional screws to fix the graft and then a cemented total hip replacement so you would not believe that you can use cemented thr in an acute traumatic case with bone grafting you know people ask about healing of the fracture healing of the osteotomy none of that is a concern this follow up is uh, at 7 years and looking at the x ray you would not know that it was such a bad bone defect again in impaction grafting uh, revision hip surgery um, we use a lot of impaction grafting on the acetabular side and also on the femoral side with cement and then you know for some cases we have uncemented but this is a five year follow up of massive impaction bone grafting this gentleman had three femoral heads that were used for bone grafting that massive defect of the acetabulum you can see what a big defect that is so the philosophy we have at writington hospital is to try and make your revision surgery look like a primary to try and make the operation more biological to try and give bone to the patient and to try and prepare for the next revision that is inevitable this was an intraoperative complication of an uncemented hip replacement that came from another hospital uh, probably because of excessive reaming of the floor and then hammering the uncemented cup and you can see that the entire acetabulum is fractured displaced fractures involving both columns so in the first stage i've taken all the hip out and fixed the acetabulum and bone grafted it and waited for healing and in the second stage uh, done a cemented total hip replacement so this is also a common case that i get in my practice which is a non union so this was almost um, a 40 year old non union which had been untreated multiple operations had been done to try and do something to the acetabulum in the 60s all of which had unfortunately failed and he came at um, about 68 years of age with a very painful non union with a partial foot drop and this gentleman had not walked for almost four decades he was in a wheelchair that was his x ray you can see acetabular non union and that that was the screw that was left in in an attempt to give lateral traction and then the screw broke inside the acetabulum that was the ct scan so during surgery the broken screw was taken out you can see that the non union is still mobile so it had not healed despite four decades now that is an osteotome that i have put inside to try and mobilize the non union as best as possible you freshen the edges bone graft it perform impaction grafting fix the non union with a plate and then i have reconstructed this in a single stage with a cemented socket and a cemented uh, stem 
So the follow up. If the X-ray, I do have X-rays of his follow up. He's coming on to almost eight years now. This was a revision surgery of um, a type of a bipolar uncemented stem that was done elsewhere with uh, a lot of pain. And the lateral part of the femur was quite deficient. So again, reconstruction with a longer cemented uh, stem using a strut graft to reconstruct the proximal femur. So we've got good data on strut grafting of the femur, which have been followed up until healing, which I think has just been published in the last three or four months. This is the case of infection. This was a cemented uh, total hip replacement, which got infected, unfortunately, multiple DARE procedures had failed. And she had a swelling with a burst sinus with multi-resistant organisms. So my standard at the moment is a two-stage philosophy for infected total hip replacements. A complete removal of the cement in case of infection. ETO only if required. And in the vast majority of cases, an ETO is not required. And then use of a nail as a spacer. So I ream the femur out, use a femoral nail as a spacer with antibiotic loaded cement. I prefer non-articulated spacers. And then this was um, after the second stage. And now she's reaching four years. The interesting thing is if you look at the primary hip on the left and the revision hip on the right, you will agree that the revision hip looks more biological, smaller sized, and we have given bone to the pelvis as compared to the primary. And that's the philosophy that I'm talking about. Make your revisions look like a primary, give back bone, try and prepare for the next operation. Ah, this was that follow up. I'm sorry for mixing up the slides, but uh, the non-union case that I just showed, one case before this, so this was the seven year follow up X-ray of the healed non-union and a cemented total hip replacement with healed impaction grafting. This gentleman walked for the first time after 40 years. This was a case of uh, pelvic discontinuity with uh, a loose acetabulum. And again, in this case, I've treated it in two stages. In the first stage, I like to fix the pelvic discontinuity, bone grafting. And then in the second stage, a total hip replacement. The circlage wire is prophylactic. When I take out uncemented stems, I prefer not to perform and ETO as far as I can. I just use a prophylactic uh, circlage and then take it out gently using um, sharp, flexible chisels. This is an example of using an augment with impaction grafting and cement. So you can see that an augment is very good for obtaining coverage and to make your rim complete and then impaction grafting of the rest of the floor with a cemented socket. On the femoral side, we have used a technique called in cement revision. So you knock out the old cemented stem, refashion the mantle, and you can use the mantle to put in a new cemented stem with cement in cement. And again, we have good data of over 15 years now of in cement revision. This makes your femoral revision really biological and it looks almost like a primary. Another example of um, a multiply revised um, hip. So I think this young lady had already had three failed hips. And this was the fourth one that I was asked to do. So you can see a big defect in the acetabulum, you know, reconstructed with a combination of impaction grafting and structural grafting coming to seven years and on the femoral side in cement revision. Another example of an infection in an uncemented stem and the patient had a malunited femoral fracture below the stem treated in two stages. The first stage is again a nail a reaming of the femur in this case, I did have to use the ETO because the stem was really well fixed. Non-articulated spacer and then the second stage total hip replacement with uh, a cemented stem and uh, antibiotics in the cement. This was an interesting case as well. This young lady came from uh, the middle of Europe. She was riding on a train. You know, like in India, people used to sit on the train, on the top of the train or on the top of the bus. So this you know this kind of uh, phenomenon is common elsewhere as well unfortunately she got electrocuted and had a femoral neck fracture that was treated with a total hip replacement which got infected so that got taken out a spacer was left in and then she was basically discharged after that and this is approximately two years after her trauma extensive burn scars on the side of the hip where you would want to do a total hip replacement so we had some help from our plastic surgeon if required Aspiration, all the other tests were negative for infection. And uh, we marked out an incision that was slightly posterior to the burns with the help of a plastic surgeon. 
so that we did not have to use any flaps or skin grafting. And the reconstruction was with the help of augments, impaction grafting of the floor of the acetabulum and a cemented total hip replacement. And that's the follow-up at about five years. Interestingly, this young lady later on uh, decided to become a doctor and join medical school. And that's her x-ray at five years. She's infection-free and she's pain-free. So those were the cases. And do we have time to discuss evidence or if about two people minutes, are bored? Uh, then... About two minutes, Nikhil, then Munjit can start. Talk yeah, that's fine. So I told you about the survivorship of the C-STEM at Writington Hospital. So we have good data up to 15 years now with a 99% survivorship for all causes, which effectively you can see is really excellent survivorship. If you get 99% surviving at 15 years, then you can be pretty confident to get 30-year data and 40-year data. Now, I don't know. I, I, sh I showed you one x-ray of a, a hip at 50 years. This is some of the other evidence from Writington Hospital. So when you look at 30-year data, the survivorship is approximately 52%, which means more than half the hips are still surviving at 50 years. And if you separate the indications for osteoarthritis and for DDH, the 30-year survivorship is approximately around 50%. But for low-demand patients like rheumatoid or ankylosing spondylitis, the 30-year survivorship is almost 77 to 80%. So the survivorship is affected by the age of the patient and by the indication. If you look at all the data from America, which is very interesting, uh, they don't really have much of 30-year or 40-year data on uh, the different types of uncemented stems. But the longest data that I could find from the United States was, in fact, the Charlie hip from Iowa from, and from the Mayo Clinic at 25 and at 30 years. So cemented hips do work in the hands of those people who are trained and who do them regularly, and it is a good hip. And this was a systematic review that uh, Dr. Parvizi published in 2013, looking at evidence from everywhere. And basically, he showed that cemented sockets are better and the available evidence did not support the widespread use of uncemented sockets. That was his message. The usual argument that I get is that cement is only good for older people. In fact, just this morning, a good friend of mine from Delhi texted me, how can I ever do a cemented hip in a young patient? So the question I ask is, how do you get 40 and 50 year survivorship data? If cemented total hip replacement was only done in older patients, you would not really get this kind of data because unfortunately, most of the patients would be dead by that time. So to get a 50 year survivorship, you have to be doing these hips in 20 and 30 year olds. This was the 40 year data from Wrightington Hospital. You can see excellent survivorship. And this data is only possible if you do it in younger people. And this patient came for follow-up quite recently, still alive, uh, 40 year follow-up of bilateral total hip replacement. And it's very common for us to see these x-rays in our follow-up clinics. One of the good things at Wrightington Hospital is we have a captive follow-up and wherever the patient has been operated upon, they get invited periodically to attend the follow-up and we get x-rays done and they religiously come to attend follow-up and that's how we collect our data because without long-term data, it is pointless really to describe any technique. And this was a recent uh, presentation on uh, 40 to 50 year data that we had in one of the HIP meetings. The registry data also uh, supports um, cemented hip replacements. In the Australian registry, <coughs> Amir Munjad is here. He's more of an expert on the Australian data than I am. But uh, to the best of my understanding, um, they could not show any major advantage of cemented and hybrid uh, between each other, but they were still better than cementless. And that's what the UK registry has sort of summarized as well, that um, the all cemented hips have the lowest uh, revision rate but the hybrid hips with the ceramic on poly are also doing extremely well. So I think our modern practice will revolve around a fully cemented hip, but hybrid hips also work extremely well. And probably in modern orthopedics, the weakness is no longer the fixation because modern uncemented stems, if done properly, also give good data and the fixation is very reliable. I think the long-term survivorship is going to be dependent on wear characteristics. And this is where we hope that... Um, the ultra high molecular weight polyethylene, which is highly cross-linked, will come into the picture. And when it is matched with um, a ceramic bearing, 
then we ought to get good long-term data in most hips that are performed well. And um, I think I can finish now, Vijay. Yep, yep, yep. Thank you, Nikhil. That was a wonderful presentation. Mm -hmm.